Good morning, everyone. Good morning. From the heavens above to the earth around here, I welcome all of you who are here in the sanctuary. And I also want to extend a warm word of welcome to those who are listening to us through KINA radio on 910 AM or 107.5 FM. And to those of you who are live streaming through Facebook or YouTube, again, welcome. This is a unique way of worship for all of us. But it's another reminder that new ways are being exposed to us and community is being expanded into new areas and new vistas. So you join us and we're so pleased that you are all here. For those who are live streaming or on KINA radio, we do invite you, if you'd like to follow along and have a bulletin, to go to our website, www.fpcsalina.org, and there is a bulletin available on the website. But we are a people of faith who come together to worship and glorify the Almighty. And we're humbled by this opportunity that is made available to us. So I ask you to please rise and join together in our responsive call to worship. Rise if you are able. When the disciples were certain that Jesus was dead, he stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Let us watch for the risen Christ this day. Easter people, Christ is risen. Please be seated. At this moment, we are still not doing congregational singing, so I invite you to open your ears, your hearts, and your spirits and listen to this very familiar hymn, Be Thou My Vision, our opening hymn. The Spirit of God helps us in our weakness, interceding with sighs too deep for words. Trusting in God's grace, I invite us to 
confess our sins using the unison prayer of confession as it's found in our bulletins. You have shown yourself to us, O God, by word and spirit, with signs in wonders, in flesh and blood. Yet we struggle to live and believe the good news of Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us, forgive us. Enter into our lives and cast out our fear so that we may come to trust in you and have life in Jesus' name. Amen. My friends, these waters remind us that we are God's beloved, that God sent his son to us, and God's son, Jesus Christ, overcame death. He overcame the boundaries of sin that separate us from God. So believe the good news that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> children's time. <laughs> can hear me out there. I'm Britton Zuccarelli. Oh, that sounds really echoey. Good. Um, obviously, I'm not Shelby, but I am the children's ministry assistant and filling in for today. And today we're going to talk about trust in our scripture lesson and how we can trust that something is true even when we can't see or feel it. So what would you all think if I told you that I have climbed Mount Everest before? Would you believe me? Like some of you know, I like to run. I'm pretty fit, right? But that's a pretty hard thing to do, so maybe you don't believe me. Well, what if I said I brushed my teeth this morning? Would you believe that? Little more believable, right? But you didn't see me do it, so you're just going to have to take my word for it, right? So sometimes that's how trust is. So I'm going to do a little trust experiment here. I'm going to ask Pastor Keith. He didn't know he was going to participate, okay? So I have this bag, and in this bag is a million dollars. Do you believe me? Aren't I trustworthy? I know you trust Pastor Keith, so let's have him look. He saw it. There's a million dollars in there. We might, we, we'll let Pastor Ewan look, too. Absolutely. Don't you guys believe them? Okay, well, they saw it. You didn't get to see it. Maybe there's some things, though, that you guys believe in that you've never seen before, like Santa. If you say you don't, you don't get presents, right? So I believe in Santa. I've never seen him. Um, there's some things that we trust in because we can't see them, but we can feel them. So like the wind, right? Like I can't actually see wind, but I can feel it blowing on my face. Um, sometimes I can see the effects of it, like it blowing in the trees, right? So I'm going to let Pastor Keith feel something, and you're just going to have to believe him because he felt it, okay? So I'm going to say there's a ball in this bag. It's kind of skinny. There's a ball. Let's see if he, don't peek. He's not peeking. What is it? It's a ball. It's a ball. Do you believe him? He felt it. 
He's trustworthy, right? Can we trust in Pastor Keith because he told us that he felt a ball? So in our scripture lesson today, we're going to hear about trust. And one of God's disi- Jesus' disciples had a hard time trusting in something that he didn't see with his own eyes or feel with his own hands. And when we celebrate Easter, it's kind of an unbelievable thing, right? That Jesus died, Jesus rose again, and he came among us. So Thomas wanted to see it and feel it with his own eyes and hands. When Jesus shows up, I bet he was kind of embarrassed, don't you think? Like, man, there really was a million dollars in here. Right? So it says a million dollars, sorry. Um, So... (laughs) Richard? So the lesson today is about trusting in God and trusting in Jesus. Even though we've never seen them, we can feel them. And we have a resource, a book full of God's truths. This is usually when I'd ask the kids, like, do you know what book that is? The Bible, right? So we have that very trustworthy resource to turn to when we feel like it's hard to believe in this same story without seeing or feeling it ourselves. Please join me in prayer. Dear God, thank you for saving us. Thank you for your love. Help us to believe even when we cannot see. Thank you for Jesus. And all God's children said, amen. And by the way, uh, you can just hand me the million dollars later. You don't have to rush at that. Let us pray. God of today and God of tomorrow, we're here to worship you because we have a longing, a deep-seated need to know you more clearly as we gather to hear your word. Dust off the corners of our hearts and clear away the cobwebs from our ears. Center us. Draw us forward. Breathe life into these ancient texts. Breathe new life into us. Amen. Today's first reading comes from the prophet Isaiah, various verses from his 43rd uh, chapter. Listen to God's word as it speaks to you. But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom. Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not withhold Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the end of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I will send to Babylon and break down all the bars And the shouting of the Chaldeans will be turned to laments. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord, 
who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise, they are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself so that they might declare my praise. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. Thanks be to God.
We give thanks to violinist Denise Blem and Angie and Britton, Marianne, Richard, and Glenn for sharing their gifts of music and in in leading us in worship this morning. Our second scripture this morning is a continuation of the one that we read last week from John chapter 20. You may remember that this is a story that began in John chapter 20 on the evening of Easter after Mary Magdalene had found the empty tomb. She had had a conversation with the risen Christ and gone and told the disciples that he was risen. The disciples had locked themselves in a room out of fear that the authorities that had killed Jesus would come after them as well. And Jesus enters that room and says, peace be with you and breathes the Holy Spirit on them and sends them out. So this is a continuation of that scripture from John chapter 20. We'll pick up at verse 24. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, and let us pray. Loving God, help us to recognize and respond with faith to the presence of Jesus with us this day and always. Open our eyes, our ears, our minds, and our hearts that we might better see, hear, understand, and feel your will for us, and guide our mouths, hands, feet, and hearts that our words, actions, and relationships might also reflect your will for us. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It is once again wonderful to be here in the sanctuary and to look out and to see so many here with us and so many more that we know are worshiping with us on the radio or on the the internet. As I said in my sermon last week, this is a special moment. This is a moment when we are able to feel more connected than we have over the past year. But this also can be a kairos moment, as I talked about last week, a kairos moment for our church where we feel a special call to action, a call that we can reset our life together as a community of faith, focusing on the peace of Christ that is available to us even in the midst of so much anxiety that we are feeling in our life together as a community of faith. You'll remember from last week that on the evening after Mary Magdalene found the empty tomb and spoke to Jesus and told the disciples about her conversation, her encounter with Christ, those disciples had been locked in a room, in a house, out of fear. And yet in the midst of their fear and the locked doors, Jesus becomes present to them and says, peace be with you. He breathes the Holy Spirit on them and sends them out into the world. But there was Thomas, the one disciple, who wasn't there. We don't know why Thomas wasn't there on that Easter evening. In fact, we don't know all that much about Thomas. Aside from the lists of the disciples that we find in Scripture, he's really only ever heard from in three episodes. Before the one that we just read today, the most prominent one was in the 14th chapter of John's Gospel. When Thomas asks, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus replies with that familiar and and inspiring, peace-giving response. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. So I think Thomas is someone who knows how to ask 
questions, and sometimes the right questions. When the other disciples tell him that they had seen Jesus, he has a hard time believing. He needs proof, physical proof, that the man that he had followed for three years, who he had just seen so horrifically killed, was actually alive. Proof that the other disciples had had the week before. Thomas gets a bad reputation. Most of the time, you don't hear us just call him Thomas. You hear him doubting Thomas. We know that Jesus does appear again with Thomas present and provides the proof that Thomas wanted. Doubting Thomas then is the first person recorded in Scripture to say to Jesus, my Lord and my God. He's the first one to make that profound theological statement that Christ is God. We may have seen, he may have seemed skeptical at first, but his encounter with the risen Jesus transformed his doubts into fertile ground for belief. So as I said, it was, it's now been one week since we, in our sermon last week, encountered the presence of Christ in the midst of our anxieties as he said, peace be with you. As we thought about the anxieties of our church and our community and our world, I wonder if we, like Thomas, need proof that Jesus is really alive and among us here today. That's what I want to explore this morning. We're a congregation whose mission statement is led by Christ, together in faith and love, we joyfully think and question and grow and serve. I want to live in, like Thomas did, to that questioning aspect so that we can grow in the midst of Christ's presence, that we can be led by Christ. The scripture that Ewan read earlier is one of my favorite from the Hebrew Bible. Isaiah 43 is written to a people who are in exile in Babylon. They had been, for, they had been uh, conquered by the Babylonian people. And because of violence, they fled their homes into a strange, not fled, they were taken from their homes to a strange land with a strange culture they weren't familiar with. They didn't know when they would be able to go home, if they would be able to go home. And to those people, God speaks through the prophet Isaiah and says, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. You are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. Do you feel the peace that permeates those words, meeting just as Jesus did a people that were needing peace, that were thirsting for peace in the midst of the unknown, of anxiety, perhaps of fear? Perhaps those words inspired hope, perhaps even courage. But the later words of Isaiah 43, we should also see through that mindset of the people who heard them originally. God says, do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Can you perceive it? Here God is reminding the people in exile of the last time that God had delivered God's people from a foreign land, the exodus from Egypt. But God was saying that it wouldn't be the same as that time, that God was doing a new thing. The way God says, do you not perceive it, makes me wonder if there were already signs present about what God was doing amongst those exiles in Babylon, and God really wanted them to notice those signs even in the midst of exile and to take hope. We need this message too. The people who had been in Egypt experienced God's presence in the Exodus. That presence led to their faith. And also, it leads to our faith because we can hear about this story in our scriptures today. But God wasn't going to show up in the exact same way again. The, the intent and the reasons why, because of God's love, are the same, but the methods change. God is doing a new thing and God does show up to deliver those exiles out of Babylon and back to Judah and Jerusalem and that too leads to their faith and our faith. The lesson that I hope we will take is that we strengthen our faith by remembering the ways God has been present with our ancestors in faith and with us over time. 
that we give thanks for the ways that God has been present in the past, in biblical times, throughout the history of the church, throughout the history of our church. We give thanks for how God is still present with us now, but we realize and understand that God doesn't operate in the same way through all of time and space. God continually does new things, and God calls us to perceive them. While the methods may change the fact that God claims us, redeems us, and calls us by name, and calls us the beloved, never changes. So let's not rely solely on the methods that God has used in the past as proof of God's presence. Let's take faith in that history, be grounded in that love that is proven throughout history, and keep alert for the new things that spring forth from God in our midst. The second thing we shouldn't do as we're looking for proof of Christ's presence or God's presence with us can be seen well in Mark chapter 6. It's about not being too tired to realize when Christ is present. Mark chapter 6 is one of my favorite chapters in scripture for seeing this. It's something that you have to look between the, the stories that are written in that chapter. It starts as Jesus pairs up his 12 disciples and empowers them to teach and proclaim miracles in the neighboring town, and he sends them out. And after we read about Jesus sending out the disciples, there's an interlude in the scripture. And then we fast forward to when the disciples return, and they're so excited to tell Jesus all about all that they had been able to teach, the miracles they had been able to do. And Jesus replies to them saying, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest for a while. The problem, though, is Jesus is very well known by now. People have seen him teach and perform miracles. So when he and the disciples hop in a boat to go to that deserted place, word spreads and people follow, arriving on foot even before the boat lands. And Jesus has compassion on that crowd and begins to teach them. And I imagine the disciples having had this long journey and in their excitement to want to tell Jesus about what they had seen and done are exhausted by this point. After a while, they come to him and encourage Jesus to instruct the crowd to go to the neighboring towns to get food since there was no food in this deserted area. And Jesus simply replies, you give them something to eat. Now those exhausted disciples the very ones who had not long ago told Jesus about the miracles they had performed after he had sent them out, now they're dumbfounded. They don't have enough money for that. I bet they don't have the energy to do it either. You might know the rest of the story. Jesus asked the disciples to collect food from the crowd. They come up with five loaves of bread and two fish. Jesus blesses the food, breaks it, and gives it to the disciples to give to the people and more than 5,000 people are fed that day. A miracle. But wait, didn't the disciples just tell Jesus about all the miracles they had done too? Couldn't they have imagined a new miracle that Jesus would empower them to do or that he could have done himself? But they were too tired. They hadn't been able to rest. The disciples, which included Thomas here, had proof after proof of who Jesus was and how Jesus was present with them, empowering them to teach and to perform miracles. They had done that teaching, they had performed those miracles, but were so tired, they couldn't realize that Jesus could do those new miracles himself or could empower them to do it. It shows why that commandment that we have in the Ten Commandments for Sabbath rest is so vital for all of us. If we don't rest every now and then, we won't be able to recognize and to respond to Jesus' presence in our midst. So we know that we, we can't always find proof of God's presence with us by only looking to what God has done in the past, and we know that if we're exhausted and haven't properly rested, it's difficult to recognize that proof of Christ's presence. Where might, might we look to find Christ's presence with us now so that we, like Thomas, can have the proof we need and we can respond, my Lord and my God? First, we need to tend to our spiritual imaginations. Reverend Dr. Roger Nishioka was a professor of mine at Columbia Seminary 
Uh, you might remember him. He preached at my installation service a few years ago here at this church. He's now at Village Church in near Kansas City. Roger once told me that you know that you are called by God to do something when your imagination and the imaginations of others that you're talking with are sparked by the same conversation, the same ideas. He said that's evidence of the Holy Spirit's presence in your midst. And at First Presbyterian Church, I feel that we must strengthen the muscles of our spiritual imaginations within our community and with one another to discern God's presence and guidance for us now. Much like the disciples prior to the feeding of the 5,000, our imaginations don't function as well when we're tired. Neuroscience tells us, and maybe I should have Britton explaining this part, neuroscience tells us that when we're tired, our brains have a hard time making connections between memories or ideas that we've had at different times and we're not able to be as creative. Many of us at this church lead very active lives. On top of that, our church Facebook page once said, we are a busy church, and I know that to be true. We've done many, many wonderful things at First Presbyterian Church, but with fewer people at our church, people who already lead active lives, it's important for us not to be so tired individually and as a church that we're not able to let the Holy Spirit spark our imaginations together. So maybe we should slow down. Maybe we need to find a way, like Jesus said, to go away to a deserted place and rest for a while. Maybe we can have the faith that once we rest, we'll be able to hear and understand what the Holy Spirit has been saying to us, and we can follow that guidance and have a renewed vigor in our church. One other way that we can find the proof of Christ's presence with us is to go to the places that we know Christ would be. Scripture tells us that we can see the face of Jesus in those who are hungry and thirsty, naked, sick, and in prison, strangers. We'll learn more about that scripture from Matthew 25 next weekend on Sunday with our Gifts of Women Sunday. Chandra Cooper will be preaching, and we hope that you'll be ready to learn about how we can seek Christ's presence by partnering in Christ's work among our siblings on the margins. Jesus is always on the side of justice and steadfast love. Micah 6.8 reminds us that God expects us to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. And whenever we encounter injustice in our community, our country, our world, you can expect Jesus to be present with steadfast love for those who have been wronged. And Jesus is also among those that are fighting against and seeking to call out and correct those injustices. If we need ideas to discuss as we seek what God is calling us to do, this is where we start. And when our imaginations are sparked, we will know that Christ is present with us and we can follow Christ's guidance to do what we are called to do. My friends, this is the bottom line. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. He is here, present, right here, right now. He comes to us like he came to the disciples in the midst of any fear or anxiety or even locked spaces. He proclaims peace, breathes the Holy Spirit on us, and sends us out. And for those of us who, like Thomas, have questions, there are ways that we can strengthen our faith in Christ's presence. We are God's beloved, and we must ground ourselves in that fact. It's our foundation, and I feel we're called to seize this kairos moment, this call to action to shore up our foundations by strengthening the ways that we recognize and respond to the presence of Christ and Christ's love and guidance in our midst. We can do that through worship and education as a church and individually. We must tend to this foundation before we attempt to build again here at First Presbyterian Church. Because when we do, when we become aware of Christ's life-altering presence among us, we receive that transformational guidance that he provides. And we are able to be led by Christ, together in faith and love, to joyfully think, question, grow, and serve. So let's seize this moment, church. In the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer. Amen.
Having heard God's word read and proclaimed through scripture and sermon and song, I invite us to stand as we're able and say what we believe using words adapted from the Confession of 1967 from our denomination's Book of Confessions. This is found in your bulletins. New life in Christ takes shape in a community in which people know that God loves and accepts them in spite of what they are. They therefore accept themselves and love others, knowing that no one has any ground on which to stand except God's grace. Amen. You may be seated. God has made the one who was rejected the cornerstone of our community of faith, a cornerstone of a new community. In the name of Christ Jesus, I invite us all to join together in prayer. And when you hear the words, hear us, O God, I ask you to respond with, your mercy is great. Holy One, as the risen Christ opened the minds of the disciples to understand the scripture and give them power through the Holy Spirit to walk boldly in this world, open us this day to the healing, wisdom, and faith given in your word. Hear us, O God. Prince of Peace, as Christ Jesus showed his wounded hands and feet to the terrified apostles, reveal to your church and to this people in prayer and all people of every faith the wounds of our neighbors, the fears of individuals and of families, and the many avenues that are available to us for healing. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Author of life, we beg for peace among nations, peace throughout communities, peace.
peace within families. Guide leaders and voters, legislatures and parliaments, judges and juries. Teach the cooperative nature of diplomacy and let our positions and practices be formed to move toward peace as we support all your creation, the animals of the field, the waters of the earth, and so much more, so that no one may go wanting. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Light in our darkness, let your brightness burn in places shrouded in violence. Reveal the pains that are hidden or go unseen. Unveil the needs of our own hearts so that we may know the power of vulnerability. Your son was raised to life from grace. Show us once again that life comes from death. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Healer of our every ill. We pray for all who are in need. For refugees and those disenfranchised and marginalized. For the growing number of people subjected to mass shootings. And for the first responders and medical teams that try to assist them for the weary and the fatigued, for those who show us the power of community to give hope to the frightened, for those who seek justice that seems to evade parts of our society, and for all who have asked for our prayers. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You command us to bring to you our deepest desires, O God. And so now we pray for those whose names we know, whose names and we may not know, but whose needs are known to so many. May our silence loudly proclaim your presence. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Trusting in your abundant mercy, O God, we now lift up to you that prayer your Son gave to us as we join our voices here and elsewhere, praying as one community of faith, declaring, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Just a few quick announcements. Please make note of those announcements on the back of your bulletins that may pertain to you. Also, as Keith has just mentioned earlier, next Sunday will be uh, the Gifts of Women's Sunday, and we invite you to join us in whatever means you can, but also we hope you can come in person. You heard last week a little about RIP Medical Debt Relief, which we're participating in. If you'd like to learn more about it and how it works, we invite you to go to our website, www.fpcsalina.org, and there is at the bottom of the opening page there a little uh, two-minute video that explains it in such wonderful ways. So please afford yourself that time to learn a little more about this uh, program and this ministry that we're seeking to be part of. 
Middle school youth will be meeting tonight uh, at the home of the Coles. Thank you, I forgot that. At the home of the Coles at 6 p.m. High schoolers, high schoolers, you can meet for coffee at 7 a.m. Thursday at Mocha's with Pastor Keith. Yes? And Haley. I'm sorry, I didn't know Haley was going to be joining you. And I'd also like to remind everyone who has been part of Virtual Parlor that we will not be meeting today. As we prepare ourselves for this morning's offering, I remind you of the several ways that you can participate in it. For those of you who are members, you can use the Realm app, which you can download. If you would like to learn more about it and how it works and how you can download it and make it work for you, please call the church office. But there's also online giving at fpcsalina.org under the gift tab. There's also texting at FPC Salina and giving the amount to 73256. And of course, one final way is through the U.S. Postal Service, mailing in your offerings to us at 308 South 8th Street, Salina, Kansas, 67401. Uh, is that correct? Yeah. I'm going on memory here. So many zip codes one sometimes has to remember, especially if you're moving around so much as I have. Ladies and gentlemen, we are an intentional community of faith. It may look a little different than it has in the past because we have used gifts of technology to join us together in community, but we are a people of faith called together to do mission and ministry in God's name. So it's with that in mind that I invite you now to present your offerings, monetary or personal, of yourself to Almighty God. Your offerings will now be received.
let us pray. Lord God, we offer these gifts to you, though you first gave them to us. Use them in your creative wisdom. Bring people together, renewed in your spirit of love. And may they be expressions of connection that build bridges, infuse lives, and bring hope to all your children. For we ask this in the name of the risen one, Jesus Christ. Amen. And just briefly, a uh, reminder that we will have our ushers coordinate dismissal after our postlude. We give thanks to Ann and Dave Payne, Pat and Will Putz here for being our ushers this morning as well. My friends, First Presbyterian Church has been through a lot this last year. Really, this, the last 10 years, if we're being honest. These difficulties can sometimes make it harder for us to see the proof of Christ's presence with us right now. But let us have faith that Christ is present with us right now, just as Christ has been present with us for 161 years in the history of this church. And as we give thanks for the steadfast love of God that God has shown through the unique calls God has given us in this church's history, let's also be at peace enough to be able to recognize the new things that God is causing to spring forth for us to be able to perceive them as they do so. May our spiritual imaginations be sparked as we are led by Christ together in faith and love to joyfully think, question, grow, and serve. And may the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and always. Hallelujah and amen. <laughs>